Hello, everyone. I'm Barbara Ham Lee. Have you ever heard of the Heckler Report? It was the outcome of the first time the federal government pulled together a group of health experts to examine the health status of minorities in the U.S. That was 30 years ago this month. The report led to significant changes towards health equity, yet 30 years later, we find there's still lots to be done to make the African-American community more healthy. And it starts by ending the obesity epidemic. Epidemic. We'll talk about it during this edition of Another View on Health with Dr. Keith Newby, right after this news from NPR. Discussing today's topics from an African-American perspective, this is Another View. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Another View. I'm Barbara Ham Lee. Right off the top, a very special and heartfelt thank you to everyone who made their pledge of support for Another View last Friday. If you were listening to WHRV-FM on Friday afternoon, you heard our president and CEO, Bert Schmidt, say that Another View will stay on the schedule for next year. It'll be our fifth year on the radio, and your support makes it possible. So thank you so so very, very much. Two things that are happening in the community very quickly I would like to tell you before we get into our health discussion today. First of all, at Old Dominion University tomorrow from noon until 4 p.m. will be the Black Male Symposium. It's being held at the Web Center on campus and it's open to the public, but you do need to RSVP. That number is 757 683 Four four zero six seven five seven six eight three. Four four zero six. This is a group of uh, young men who want to talk about the things that have been happening in society lately. The the uh, supposed war against um, black males in particular, and what's going on. And from a uh, college perspective, from a scholarly perspective, um, their thoughts on what's happening. So I think that'll be something very very interesting. The Black Male Symposium tomorrow from noon until four at the Web Center. And I hope you will join me tonight at. Uh, um, 5.30 to 7.30 at the Old Dominion University, Norfolk State University, Virginia Beach campus. Uh, we will be talking um, about the movie um, Freedom Riders. And this is a part of the YWCA of Southampton Road's Stand Against Racism event. We're going to have a stellar panel discussion about the Freedom Riders and about what happened during that time in our history. It is free. It is open to the public. And we're also going to honor the Phyllis Wheatley Racial Justice Essay Contest winners. These are high school students who talk about ways to end racism. So that should be pretty interesting. That's this afternoon at 5.30, um, and I hope to see you in the place. April is National Minority Health Month, and what better place to examine the health issues of the African-American community than right here on Another View. I'm joined today by my Another View on Health co-host, cardiologist Dr. Keith Newby. Hey, Keith, how hey. you doing? All right, and yourself? Good, I'm doing great. Welcome, Wonderful. good to see you. Yeah, it's been a minute. Yeah, it has yeah, been, I absolutely. Said, I thought you were trying to avoid me. I I'm thought, not trying to avoid thought you. you I said I had a disease or something. <laughs> I was wondering, so <laughs> it's good to see you. I'm here. It's good to, I'm glad you're here. Along with Dr. Olivia Newby, Doctor of Nursing Practice and Certified Diabetes Educator and the sister-in-law of Dr. Keith Newby. How you doing, Olivia? Fine and excited to have a great conversation about obesity and health and nutrition. Absolutely. Thank you so much for joining us. And joining us by phone is fitness expert, teacher at Lansdowne High School and coach uh, Thomas Anderson, who is joining us from the Penn State Relays because he has a team up there from Virginia Beach. Is that right? That's correct. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. So how are things going there? Well, it's a chilly and chaotic uh, situation <laughs> here. If you've ever been to the Penn Relays in Philadelphia, I'm a native of Philadelphia, and uh, we've been trying to bring our athletes from the Tidewater area for uh, the past 25 years to give them an opportunity to compete and showcase their talents and uh, allow uh, the multiplicity of college coaches that are here to see uh, what our kids can do in the Tidewater area and potentially earn scholarships. So it's a it's a hectic situation up here because of 
all the different countries and uh, the competitive nature that's here, but it's a great experience for our young men and young women, and hopefully it'll be a life changer for them. That is fantastic. So they're out there showing their best. Absolutely. Yes, they are. Um, it's funny because the Jamaicans who pretty much dominate the uh, high school level here, and they will go on to become uh, Olympians for their country. Mm -hmm. uh, they're actually running here trying to earn uh, spots at American universities, you know, the, the larger schools, Texas, Texas A&M, oh. Oregon, and those colleges are here. So our American kids really have to step up to the plate today and compete at a high level in order to try to put themselves in the best possible situation to earn scholarships. So it's a unique, fun atmosphere. Uh, it's very competitive, um, but it's also one that, uh, you know, allows our young people to have some hopes and aspirations to compete for our country, uh, whether it be in the collegiate level or also um, for the USA uh, and the World Championships and at the Olympics. So it's, it's a great experience. That's fantastic. Well, we wish you all the best of luck, and we thank you for taking some time out to talk with us today well, on Another so View. Thank you for the opportunity because uh, we're, it's, it's a pleasure to be able to share uh, some of the insights that um, I can bring as far as with sports and, and athletics and teaching and uh, dealing with a large array of our young people and those who are our age and maybe a little bit older. So okay. I hope I can give you some help. <laughs> Fantastic. So 30 years ago, the Heckler Report came out. That was actually the name of the um, uh, head of health back then, back 30 years ago. The report was actually called the Report of the Secretary's Task Force on Black and Minority Health. And in that report, at the as a result of that report, um, a couple of milestones happened. The Jackson Heart Study explored reasons for cardiovascular health disparities. The Healthy Start Program, which I think a lot of people are familiar with, getting kids off to a healthy start, brought infant mortality prevention efforts to underserved communities. And the National Standards for Culturally and Linguistic linguistically appropriate services in health and health care basically taught doctors how to speak to minority patients. And Olivia, you had some experience in that, did you not, in terms of your doctorate? Yes, part of my doctorate is realizing, like many diseases, it is food-related. And to make plans or teach or uh, the patient to um, work where they are in terms of what their eating habits, their living habits, and to design a program or education that is patient-centered, but yet culturally tailored uh, to enhance their compliance and as long as well as reduce the disease. So, Keith, when you were in med school, mm -hmm. did they teach you all, or, or do you remember taking a class on how to deal with patients, how to talk with them so that they could understand what's going on, or has that ever changed in your practice? Well, from from my perspective as a medical student, they didn't have anything even remote like that. Yeah, one thing I've I've found in medicine is you know, some people have a gift of gab when it comes down to knowing how to relate to other people. And unfortunately, so in medical school, there's mostly books, you know, the, yeah. it's the educational part of how to be a doctor itself, meaning how to, how to evaluate a patient, how to administer the medications or treatment strategies. But when you talk about this, what I found, this is something you pick up as you go along because, again, mm -hmm. how you relate to people says what that disease, how you can really pull out what that disease process may be. In other words, like somebody tells me they have chest pain, mm -hmm. you know, you have to really kind of get into understanding what, you know, what's going on that's causing that. You know, if there's some other issue going on, if you understand the culture, a lot of times you may be able to pick up um, how to ask the question. But unfortunately, so, you know, you have to, when mess, you have to pay attention. You know, you have to, that's something you just pick up as you go along. But I, now I'm not sure about like today's medical schools if they may have something like that. Because we now. know you went back in the dark. Yeah, it was, it was a minute ago. <laughs> I ain't going to sit there and try to front on that. <laughs> it was a minute ago. But, but you know, to be honest with you, but I have found the younger doctors have even less clue than that when I, really? yeah, I mean, they don't have a clue. I mean, when they, a lot of times I get a call about seeing a patient and they'll make a, tell me something's going on with them. And I get an entirely different story when I talk to the patient. I'm like, who are you talking to? Because one of the person I was talking to told me something entirely different. But again, a lot of that is how you speak to people. You know, that's, and I'm sure Olivia, because Olivia's actually expert at doing that. That's one of the things I give her a lot of credit for is we've had mutual patients together. They always tell me how much they love her because she, she keeps it real with them. She knows how to speak to them in a way that they understand, they can relate. And that impacts because, you know, in medicine, you have to grow trust. 
trust is grow is, is it grows out of how you relate you know can they relate to you as an individual and i know that that it, it, particularly from a cultural perspective within the african american community at one point in time if a doctor said you know the sky is purple then the sky was purple and nobody questioned it and there was not that back and forth um but today i think the doctors are even more encouraging for patients to be more active in their own care is that right? Very much so, because there are so many nationalities, so many different social economical uh, um uh, way of treating everything. So the patient will guide you because one of my earliest experience, I was so used to everybody having breakfast, lunch and dinner and food was basically the same. But once the I asked the lady, what did you have for breakfast? And she said, I had the pot. I, of course, I was like, well, what are you talking about? Mm-hmm. When she told me that was everything left over from the night before, she put it in a pot, and that was the breakfast. That oh. was my starting point to realize what I perceive breakfast is. is not necessarily what is going on in the patient home. So from that point on, the question is, what are you eating? What are right. you preparing? So that's how the concept of patient-centered and culturally tailored has evolved because the patient is guiding us what may work for you doesn't work, especially since so many patients are single-family homes. Those dynamics may not be there from that typical provider. Mm-hmm. My daughter, who's in uh, finishing medical school, you get to hear all the book knowledge, but the real world knowledge is so different. And how do you plan that medication regimen versus what it what is? What the book tells you what should, it, should work. Right. Absolutely. Okay, here's a statement No population has a higher overweight or obesity rate than African-American women. I just think that is just, I mean, it it (laughs) caught my breath (laughs) when I read that. I mean, of all the groups, of all the different breakdowns, African-American women are the heaviest. What is obesity doing to our community, Keith? Well, essentially, it's just the disease processes that come as a result. I mean, it's it's not even just that. It's so many other things, even, you know, personally, you know, you think about somebody that's overweight, how other people may treat that person. So, you get some depression sometimes in there, self-esteem issues. Then, then you get into the health issues. You know, you talk about uh, poor healing. You know, diabetes, which is a big thing, hypertension. You know, uh, arthritis. You know, all these things that uh, you know come about. Arthritis comes from obesity. Yeah, well, you think about it, you really? put a lot of pressure on joints. You know, if mm-hmm. if, if you're really carrying, you know, and actually, uh, uh, you know, and I'm, I'm gonna call him Mr. Anderson he, since he won't call me <laughs> Keith. I'm gonna call him Mr. Anderson. He'll be able to kind of chime in as it relates to what he sees um, from a uh, physical fitness standpoint. Mm-hmm. I was just that. coming to yeah. him. On yeah. That. So yeah. that that, but I have found that you know that it is, and it's a host of other things. Cancer risk goes up with uh, being obese, and I just read a report about prostate cancer and African American men coming from obesity as a uh, meaning that group was so much there. Their, their, their risk of prostate cancer was almost a hundred percent in certain you know patient groups. Mm-hmm. You know, compared to the, if you weren't obese. Let me. I want you to also, Olivia, and then I'm coming to you, Thomas. Um, to yeah. explain to people too, because in our meeting this morning, one of the interns said, well, are they overweight or are they obese? Explain what obese means. Because I think people think okay, huge, so, and that's not necessarily the case. You said that we are overweight. A lot of African-Americans, body image denial. We are more accepting that obesity is a part of the life cycle, Mm -hmm. feel that the ideal body weight is too thin and not for black people. And we feel we are big boned and generally are more at weight and we have a distorted image. So what is our image? Well, a bot, what we look at the body BMI, and if your BMI, which is over 30, body mass index, mm -hmm, right? mm -hmm, Mm -hmm. Body mass index over 30. And then we consider it uh, extreme obese over 40. So those are the defined definitions. And overweight is 25 to 29. So anything under um, 30, you're overweight. But once that BMI exceeds that 30, you are obese. Mm -hmm. 
Yes. And you check your, how, how do you actually check the BMI? Okay, great question. Um, first, we look at that body mass um, BMI from a, um, it's a number calculated from a person's weight and height. And it is the screening tube tool that we use as an ideal body weight. So your height and weight, and we do the calculation from that. Mm -hmm. So, Thomas, when you see your your athletes, when you see kids in high school, um, and, and they you can look at them and tell whether or not they may have a high BMI, correct? Well, actually, um, uh, to chime in on uh, what Dr. Newby was saying, is that at uh, Virginia Beach City Public Schools, and actually throughout the state of Virginia, we have to do a fitness test, and we start with uh, we call physical education level one and level two, which are typically students are in the ninth and tenth grade, and so we have to run a battery of tests, and we use the, those numbers, and they're calculated for their BMI, and the report is printed for our students. We do three uh, tests annually. And um, we do uh, a comparison when the student comes to us in September. We have a mid-year test, which is done in January. And we've just actually completed last week at our high school uh, the third and final test. And we, are, um, we use that information to help screen potential candidates that may be uh, at risk as far as uh, with obesity and um, being overweight. And so we also involve that in our curriculum. So uh, in physical education, it's not just going out and playing, but we encourage our students to participate in lifetime sports because, unfortunately, the way the curriculum is designed after their 11th grade year, they are not mandated to take physical education anymore in, uh, in, at, at the high school level. So you will actually let students go at the age of 16 or 17, and they may not be involved in any more physical activity for the duration of their life. And that's, that's concerning. Hmm. And so it's important that we as educators make sure that we have a positive experience for them and we help target them. I think the days where we were just into sports and competing are going to pretty much be uh, eroded, and we're going to be involved more in lifestyle changes as far as diet that's in our curriculum mm -hmm. and being able to do what we call cross-curriculum teaching uh, with physical education and activity diet. Uh, as Dr. Newby was saying, self-esteem, personal hygiene. So everything pretty much is a collaboration right now as opposed to just being one element. Just out of curiosity, uh, Mr. Anderson, uh, <laughs> what, what is, uh, what, what's your take on, uh, while we're on this topic of ratios of obesity, with uh, African Americans versus non African American kids, I mean, because you give me like as example, what's your, what, just on a rough guesstimate, what's what's your percentage of uh, obese kids that you are seeing in your school who are African American? You think it's like fifty yeah, percent greater? To, that's a great question because we actually have to do demographics based on gender and mm -hmm. of ethnicity so that we can try to target some of the problems and. Um, I would think right now with our population at Lansdowne, and I don't have all the data from every classroom, but you know, I would say roughly about 13% of our African Americans, including male and female, uh, have some form of obesity or uh, overweight issues. So, um, and once again, when we have them, they're at the ages between 14 and sometimes 18. And so those numbers can actually increase if the activities and the problems aren't addressed. So a student at 16 years of age that stops activity, and let's say their BMI is at 27%, uh, you know, within the next five years, that number could drastically increase. So um, it's a concern, and I, it, I think it's a lot of factors. Uh, one of the things is uh, physical education has been slowly moved out of some school curriculum, so the activity level has diminished. And the other thing is our lifestyle. Um, you know, kids nowadays, unlike during uh, our earlier years, they're, they're less active. Uh, mm -hmm. They're using computers and video games, so there's a secondary lifestyle that uh, we have to uh, pretty much compete with. Thomas, so let, me ask, it, let, yes, me, let me ask you a quick question. Um, one of the... Uh, uh, our producer's daughters were saying that some of their friends that play football, they look like they're all muscle. They mm -hmm. about, but they may be about 20, 30 pounds overweight. So are they mm -hmm. considered uh, uh, to be obese, even though, what, you know, they're, they're, they're muscular, they're playing football? Well, what, what I try to do with our, with the sports, because it's a, and, and I try not to really categorize them as athletes and non-athletes, but I, I believe everyone has a professional 
uh, sports body. And I say that from the standpoint, huh. even if you're not playing on a, a varsity level or on a collegiate level, on a pro level, uh, your body is money, as Dr. Newby was elaborating on earlier. And those health risks, are, they cost. And when we have to do surgeries and see doctors and all the treatment, it costs. So even though they're not getting millions of dollars to compete, it's important that they understand that they are pro athletes as well. So all of us pretty much are lumped in that category. But to answer your question more specifically, um, what we like to do with, with our athletes is we look at their percentage of body fat um, because sometimes the numbers can be slightly skewed when you look at height and weight with the BMI. Mm -hmm. And for us, the percentage of body fat. So if it's an elite athlete, uh, male, we're looking at probably about 4 to 6% uh, with a female about 8 to 10%. And so I would say with our general population, I think we also need to, you know, expand our numbers and, and, and you know, not just be limited to, to one standard, but also look at their percentage of body fat as well. So uh, a young man who may come in the weight room who's six foot three, you know, 320 pounds, mm -hmm. you know, there's a lot of variables in there. Is it, you know, if his percentage of body fat is 12%, then that may not be bad. And you could still have the same type of uh, a structure and their percentage of body fat could be 28 to 30 percent and you know the young man is a little bit less healthy so uh, we like to use those that that as well to uh try to help direct our young people okay 440-2665 or 1-800-940-2240 are the numbers to call to join our conversation we're talking about obesity in the african-american community and uh, my question to the audience is you know, do you feel that uh, you need to make some changes? And if so, call our experts today, 440-2665 or 1-800-940-2240. Vicki joins us from Virginia Beach. Hi, Vicki. You're on the air. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, question. I've heard different people have a conversation about the BMI and that the feeling is there should be a different BMI used for African Americans because in general, the way our bodies are are going to be a lot different than Caucasian. And I'll take the response off the air. But do you have any comments with regard to that okay. question? Okay. Thank you so much for your call, Vicki. You smile, Dr. Newby. Well, I mean, I just, this is kind of a standard. I think we've kind of gotten ourselves, and, I, and Olivia may know more than I on this one, but, you know, I tend to think, I think we've convinced ourselves that it should be different for reasons unclear and that granted there are differences in terms of you know certain aspects of our physicalities but i don't think they're that different that should have packed the bmi i think we've got so used to feeling we should be heavier that we've convinced ourselves that mm -hmm. uh you know that the bmi shouldn't apply to us but the problem is and, and the reason why i say that look at the data in terms of who's getting sick it's yes. us. You know, it's not anybody else. I mean, what I should say, I mean, it's more us right. than, more any, us than, than, the other than anybody groups. else. Mm -hmm. So by definition, I mean, just looking at the, the, the fallout of what, of what we've tried to convince ourselves of is that, uh, you know, we should be different. But the problem is we're getting, we're the ones that with all the disease processes. And I tell people all the time, go to any dialysis center. And you go in Idaho and you're going to see nothing but the brothers in there. You go to uh, anywhere. I mean, we are the ones with kidney failure. We're the ones that you with look at. The highest incidence yeah. of diabetes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, we are just so over the top in disparity with these chronic diseases, as Keith right. mentioned, that let's say the call of Vicki that mm -hmm. you perceive as I myself used to feel they were skewed towards Caucasian. But as we studied this, the disease process is. No, this BMI ratio is appropriate because we exceed that ratio so much that we are number one for heart disease, diabetes compared to ca Caucasians. Mm -hmm. And death rates higher, and everything. Death for kidney disease. Yeah, yeah. So let's say we convince ourselves and say it's wrong. Bottom line, We're getting something's different. wrong with <laughs> our perception yeah. because we are losing this war on our face denial that it is wrong. Mm -hmm. Now, let's. A lot of times we hear people talk about, um, you know, food deserts in in lower socioeconomic neighborhoods, um, cracked sidewalks. It's, it's more difficult to get out mm -hmm. because of the danger of the neighborhood or or you know the the inability to smoothly walk yeah. and take those kinds of things. Um, 
uh, the lack of, of or the amount of advertising that hits kids, particularly African-American children, the billboards that are mm-hmm. up in the neighborhoods with there their fast is. foods and, and so forth. But if you look across all social economic levels in the African-American community, you will find people who are obese. Yeah. So what's the excuse for the middle class? I think it's just become we got we got lazy. I mean, the bottom line, I think we've we're we're, we're just like I think uh, Mr. Anderson mentioned earlier. I'm gonna keep doing this, Tom, just so you know that. <laughs> uh, you know, but you know, I think we've gotten so um, because even you think about when we were all young, um, you know, your mom kicked you out of the house. Mm-hmm. What you sitting up in here for? Get out there and play, do something, you know. And you would go out and make sure you come back when the street lights yep. came on. That that activity we used to do used to keep us proportionally what we would eat. We were burning off. I mean, the biggest argument I always have with patients is they keep coming up with this idea to say, "I'm not hardly eating anything. Why am I gaining weight?" I said, "Well, your depth. What do you call not hardly eating anything? Because that's different from the rest of the world. Because if you were eating appropriately, you would not be gaining weight. The fact that you are now, there are some health issues that can do that. Mm-hmm. You know, and of course, you know, back in the day, you hear everybody talking about their glands are messed up. I'm like, listen, you know, glands ain't messed up. You eat too much. <laughs> I mean, we eat the wrong things. I mean, we we you know, you look at what's at these convenience stores where we get the food from." And I understand why, Processed because, food. yeah, yeah. yeah I mean, mm-hmm. I understand why, because you think about it, you go to McDonald's or some other fast food place, you can get a meal for a dollar, mm-hmm. you know, and people say, okay, I can spend a dollar or I can spend 20 and uh, to get something that may be healthier. But it's like, listen, the bottom line, I don't have a certain amount of money to do this with. And uh, this is easy, as fast, as easy. You know, you get it and you're done. Okay. The, the problem is just the, the aftermath of it. So when we talk about us, we just, I think we've just learned to, kind of make excuses for ourselves but you know and, and think about it in the middle class is more access because you got more money i mean it's standardly so you, you got more time to go and spend it on these places but it's just we, we're the culture what we see on tv every day what we see like you say these billboards and everything else everything is geared towards going to do this and it's geared away from the healthy from stuff. eating healthy four four zero two six six five or one eight hundred nine four zero two two four zero are the numbers to call to join our conversation if you're just joining us we're talking about national minority health month and the obesity epidemic in the black community with my co-host cardiologist dr keith newby doctor of nursing and certified diabetes educator uh, olivia newby and thomas anderson who is a fitness expert so olivia when you see people come in when you see a 20 year old Mm -hmm. come in and they are already have type 2 diabetes Mm -hmm. what does that what does that tell you? What do you? Well, when I and I see that patient, my first thing is to decide to determine where are you eating at? Because when she eats out uh, more than twice a week, that increases her weight by 50 percent. And the incident that I have a young lady, her mother works many hours, so everything is generally processed. Mm-hmm. And so those are sugar, salt and fat three things that make food taste good and culturally all of our foods is traditionally prepared with high fat uh, meats and sodium salt Mm -hmm. so that 20 year old is to determine let's say you're going to eat at mcdonald's fast food then we start right there and find foods they sell at McDonald's that we can find an alternate choice. So trying to convince her to buy the salad as opposed to the Big Mac. Yes, as an but example. let's say she don't want the salad. Well, why not the sandwich with the lettuce and tomato? Hmm. So we got a green in there. We got a superfood, the tomato. We did not cause her any. She was still able to hang with a friend, but where this patient is, I had to start the plan right in her house what does she do every day do you think that's the reason why a lot of people become afraid or or reticent about starting to change their lifestyle because they think of it as a diet as opposed to just making other choices right it's that whole concept of diet just sounds too hard and if we get away from that and just say eating healthy and that tends to help out with the better understanding to improve. Even if I, whatever they choose, I find an alternate right within their means and their availability mm-hmm. of getting that product. 
Keith, you brought up something when we were talking before the show started, um, which really I hadn't even thought about. But the other complication, one of the other complications of being overweight is if you have to have surgery. Yeah, that was, uh, yeah, that was one of the things we had discussed. I, I run to that issue more than anything else when you're trying to do heart catheterizations or put in defibrillators or pacemakers. You know, if, if you know, you're know trying to get to the vessels or to get to the tissue layer that uh, you have to create pockets or whatever to uh, put it like if it's a defibrillator. You know, there, there's a couple of complications. One is, you know, when they're laying down, their, their, their tissue tends to rise. It goes up towards the chest wall. So when you're trying to figure out, okay, where I'm going to make this incision, you know, you have a narrow hole because with the all the drapes and stuff, you have to use. You have to make sure you're in the right location. Mm -hmm. And then when when you don't have those mark those landmarks, because usually when we're doing these, we look at the clavicle and the shoulder, and you can actually see where you're heading. But when there's that much tissue, the shoulder, I mean, the, the clavicle gets buried. You can't see it. You know, so you have to feel. You have to pull down, and you and and then it, you're talking about the we talk about four inches you know, down of, of, actual of, of actual fat to get to that layer you have to get to. That's a lot to go through. The bleeding risks go up because they get the t fat is very highly vascularized. Mm -hmm. So when you're talking about cutting oh. through that fat tissue, it's going to bleed a lot. So you got that complication. Then trying to get, you know, needles under the collarbone so you can get into the vein. Then you, uh, you and you're at an angle going down because the tissue rises up. So you got to push it down and then try to get I'm underneath to that without oh. collapsing the lung. So you talk about some issues with that, you know, heart catheterizations. If the vessels are four inches down, you got to figure out where they are. Normally we can feel for the pulse and know where to go. But if, if you got four inches of tissue, you can't feel anything. You know, we have to use special needles, Doppler needles, you know, uh, ultrasound needles. Just try to find vessels to do these procedures. So you actually put yourself in even more danger. Oh, yeah. For if you have to have surgery, yeah, if yeah. you're overweight. Yeah, you, you really are. And they don't, a lot of patients wow. don't understand that. I told them I'm sweating bullets trying to, you know, when it, by the time I'm done from all the concentrating and feeling and pushing, <laughs> I mean, I'm dressed in sweat coming out of a case. It normally takes me 10 or 15 minutes. It may take me an hour or more, sometimes two hours to do. Mm -hmm. uh, a case that normally would take 15 minutes. And that's all based on that one complication. But I get more concerned with this, the patient, not me. I get right. more worried about them because you don't want them coming out of a procedure and, you know, worse than when they went in. So you got to be extremely careful. I pray for every case you know, just to make sure <laughs> that when I go in, I hate to say it like that, but you, you know, you just never know what the future is going to hold. So, I mean, I feel very good at what I do, but I'm still, you know, things can always be predicted. So that yeah. does play a big factor. Wow. 440-2665 or 1-800-940-2240. Lisa joins us from Chesapeake. Hi, Lisa. You're on the air. Hi. I had a, a quick comment about uh, the point that do African-Americans have a harder time uh, with the diet than, say, Caucasians. When I lived in Hawaii, that was very much a topic uh, specifically for the Pacific Islanders. They uh, noticed that their diet, the westernized diet, really wreaked havoc on them compared to the, um, you know, the regular diet of fish and rice. And so I'm wondering if there's any kind of correlation with just your ethnic background and what you are able to eat and whether or not that really does play more of a role for some people. Thank you so much for that call. Dr. Olivia Newby, you want to take that one? Yes. Um, the, in the African-American diet is often... Um, high in fat, calories such as um, lard and Crisco oil. We use a lot of pig feet, oxtails, all kinds of fatty meat to season it. And those things are the biggest contributor to obesity and the weight gain. So, yes, um, that diet uh, plays a big role in how obesity um, increases in certain communities. So diets um, that are high in um, vegetables and fruit and lean meat tends to, of course, help in reducing that obesity. Olivia, let me ask you a question, too. When we're talking about these vegetables and so forth, because one of the um, points is that you can't drown it in... in um, Butter, ha yeah, butter or ham hocks or, or none of that seasoning all, all meat. The, all the seasoning meat that that is culturally a part of that's a part of our culture. Rarely do I get a patient that cooks without wanting to add that. And every time I introduce it, I always say start with taking that meat out, 
and um, cooking it with a little bit of water and other ways. And that's part of my teaching in my diabetes class. What about class. smoked turkey next? That's still a meat. Why do we have to add any of that? <laughs> I'm trying to get out of the meat. I said you were reaching on that exactly one. Exactly, I was. It tastes better. <laughs> but really, you can fix that food and prepare it to taste just as well with other seasonings we are not used to. And that's my whole diabetes group visit is teaching and, and my garden is teaching us to taste food other than and learn how to enjoy food without the animal fat. Mm. And what I think it really boils down to, you know, to be honest with you, is what we're used to. That, yes. that, com- that comment that the caller made, you know, about the different diets may wreak havoc on certain people. What, you know, like an example, when I cut back and I'm doing all the stuff I'm doing now with cutting out the sugars and what have you, my diet. See, if I eat something like that now, I mean, my stomach goes through all kinds of trials and tribulations. So once your, bu- yeah, your body Yeah, because I got used to it, mm-hmm. uh, not eating that stuff anymore. So you, when you do that, I, I don't know that it's necessary that it's wreaking havoc eating a healthier diet as much as this. You know, you were probably eating a bad diet in the first place. And then when you start eating something different, you know, you, your body has to get adjusted to that. You know? Gradually. And, and, yeah. Always yeah. introduce yeah. something. Uh, I don't start with major change. Something gradual. Okay. Uh, Barry joins us from Elizabeth City. Hi, Barry. You're on the air. Hey, you know, you know, these fast food chains like, you know, Bojangles, Popeyes and all that stack the deck, the deck against most of African-Americans. Correct. They hire African-American actors. And say it's cool, you know, to eat this Louisiana fried shrimp and all this other fried <laughs> stuff. That kind of stacks the deck against the, the people, you know. <laughs> but that is very true. Uh, thanks so much, Barry. We appreciate very that. Very true. <laughs> Could have said it better. <laughs> and trying to trying to make it attractive to to the community, and that makes it makes it even more difficult. Okay, so our I'm I'm looking at the control room because they're going crazy about the greens. So they want you to tell us some more other ways to cook the greens so that it would taste that they would taste good. What other seasonings, in other words, should we consider? I really use uh, one of the first things I've learned to stop cooking those greens and our vegetables all day uh, and to use your garlic, your red peppers, your bell, all your peppers and your onions to enhance the flavor, basil and mm. teach, learn and rosemary. Learn so it doesn't take all day to cook greens. No, <laughs> no, no. And spinach. That's the new, yeah. that's a, and kale. I introduced and, kale. and those, uh, and they cook five to seven minutes. Done. And it is packed with nutrition. Anybody who knows me, sees me as a patient, we talk about diet first and foremost, and I incorporate how do I prepare it, mm-hmm. which is mm-hmm. a big issue, is mm-hmm. getting away from that. Okay. Yeah, so, so this, this is my question, because your, your uh, control room, aren't they a bunch of young people in there? They are young people so, in so, there. They're used then, to eating those yeah, greens so with those what's, ham hocks. What's up with that? <laughs> <laughs> Liz joins us from Hampton. Hi, Liz. You're on the air. I'm so glad to be on the show, and Thank you. this is such a fascinating topic for me. I do a lot of uh, growing and have some organic farming experience, and I see a huge opportunity, especially in low-income areas where the city, like the um, housing authority, where they could be putting in fruit trees and nut trees, and people could just be harvesting fresh out right in their um, neighborhoods. Mm-hmm. That's good Actually, and, we have something to tell you, Liz, that you're going to be very, very excited about. Um, Go Liz, ahead, Olivia. <laughs> I, as a diabetes educator, um, knowing that diet and the same questions about fat, I found that getting the ba- eliminating the barrier of getting uh, fresh vegetables learning to teach my patients and I have started my own community garden and we grow the vegetables for the patients. And this year we're bringing in two um, uh, housing facilities and they are actually sharing in the work. And so teaching them to learn to grow their own um, tomatoes, which is a superfood, awesome, great vitamins and just all your vegetables, something that they can do at home. But yet we are starting a community garden so that they can um, have access and low available uh, vegetables. So that she's uh, she's gone with us now, but but so and you were saying also it's also a bringing together of, of the seniors, bringing in particular them together. that are coming in and and, and socialization. 
the too. socialization and stress being stuck in a high rise or apartment and to getting out to working in the garden uh, also has proved to help in the benefit. They're walking, they're moving exercise yeah. Thomas speaking of exercise then I mean do you find that that I know the schools uh, have done things like taking sodas out of the vending machines and um, having uh, two percent or one percent milk and things of that nature how do the kids react to that well I think one of the things that's uh, critical that we need uh, need to emphasize is that it's about educating our people uh, we know the statistics and we know the information uh, is disturbing and so now it's, it, it's essential for us as educators to uh, start as probably early as middle school and uh, no later than when we, they come to our level about all these numbers and the ramifications. So um, despite the fact that they may want certain foods and we're, we're fighting this uh, stigma, uh, it's important for us to share the information because we're talking about lifestyle changes and we're talking about your life as opposed to uh, what we enjoy. And so one of the things that also uh, that we were talking about is education. And sometimes our African-American students are coming from school systems where they don't have all the resources and the information that's important for them to be able to fully understand uh, what we are asking them to do as far as their BMI and weight and those things. So I think if we are more proactive instead of reactive, uh, we'll have a better situation. Um, we use a, a pyramid uh, eating chart uh, with our students so that they can try to pick particular uh, diets. Uh, we try to do relevance as far as education of if we, if you, uh, we're given lifestyle uh, situations where if you're a restaurant owner and you have a, you know, certain menu, what's going to be healthy as opposed to what can just be profitable. So it's important for this next generation to understand the holistic view as opposed to just, uh, you know, eating to, to eat. So mm -hmm. uh, we have a big challenge ahead of us. Uh, Keith, let me ask you this then. How do you, how do we stop or how do we change the dynamic when it's Sunday dinner and you go over and grandma says, child, you need a little more, more meat on I your know, bones. I know. That's, <laughs> the, that's the toughest thing I've found in anything is, is just trying to, um, you know, it, it, you know, you ever hear the term, it takes a village to raise a child, you know, to change a culture, it really does take a, a village. I mean, it's, it's so hard if you, you know, it, I mean, it's like your willpower has to far exceed that around you and the, the culture itself has to change. I mean, we, we're just used to eating a certain way. We, we think, and we've convinced ourselves that things taste good because our taste buds have gotten acclimated mm -hmm. to this because we've been eating this way all our life. But like I say, if I put, if I drop you in the middle of the Sahara Desert and left you there for a month and said, fend for yourself <laughs> and, you know, everything get, would yeah, taste good. Everything would taste good. And I <laughs> yeah. guarantee you that a lot of stuff that you were, got used to eating there is going to be different from what you eat if you came back to the States because you've gotten used to eating something different because you had no access to anything else. See, we have access to the stuff and we've continued to eat and behave a certain way because that's the way we were taught and raised to mm -hmm. behave. But some of us have broken out of that because we've kind of, like I say, and I know with, uh, I'm, I'm going to call him Tommy, even though he always calls me Dr. <laughs> Newby. But I, was, I, I know that a lot of that is based on, I, mean, I watched him. We, we did at our church, we did a, had a, um, a men's breakfast there about, I think, what was it a couple of months ago, Tom? I think it was. Yes, that's correct. Yeah, and yeah. actually, Tom inspired me to change my lifestyle around a bit because I watched his presentation and what he was trying to really do. And we talked a lot about, as men, you know, especially as African American men, you know, our our duty and our responsibility is to be healthier for our families and for the people around us. So, true. I mean, hearing that really inspired me to really start getting on my job to do what I need to do for myself. But I had to make myself. And sometimes you, some people like like Tom would touch somebody just based on what they say, and that's all you need to do is get touched by one person, and that may ultimately change your lifestyle. So we as a, as a unit could keep help hammering this issue out there. Mm -hmm. I mean, it really, it can make a difference and it can change that, but that has to be where it has to be more than one people. I tell people all the time, if your spouse, like my wife, I, you know, she and I have been walking, you know, walking now. together, got to yeah. do something. Yeah. With yeah. Buddy. We, yeah. When we do things together, we're going to do a lot. It's going to turn out a lot uh, better to me than if we try to do it individually, because then as a unit, we, we watch each other's back. You know, mm -hmm. if, uh, if I'm about to sneak something, <laughs> She said, what are you getting ready to get? You know, but sometimes that helps. Hold you accountable. Yeah, That's yeah. What and, it does. and to me, that 
piece of it all is really where we need to head to change the dynamics of what we have. Okay, Thomas, we've got um, like about two minutes left, so I want to give you very short one piece of advice you want to give folks in terms of physical fitness. Uh, the 30 thing, seconds. As Dr. Newby elaborated on, African-American men, we are almost an endangered species. And so we need to enlighten our communities and our loved ones. Uh, our life expectancy, uh, or according to some statistics, is only 61 years of age compared to 71 years of age in other ethnic groups. And so that not only has an emotional distraction as far as the, and the dynamics of the family, but it also affects us economically. When we're not there, we can't provide for our families in the financial standpoint and the emotional standpoint. So it's, as Dr. Newby had uh, stressed earlier, it's all of our responsibilities because we care and we have to uh, really embrace one another and make this uh, lifestyle issue. If you go to some universities uh, where uh, the, 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 the culture is different than in our communities, they run. Exactly. They're moving. And they it's, understand the importance of their life depends on them taking responsibility. And we as a culture have to do the same. Okay. Thank you so much. That is Mr. Thomas Anderson, who is a coach tracking football. He's a teacher at Lansdowne High School, Virginia Beach. He's a physical fitness expert and he's at the Penn Relays. Good luck to you. We appreciate you, Thomas. Thanks so much. Thank you all so much and God bless you. You too. And Olivia, we got less than a minute. So huh. something real quick you want to say to folks Good to thought. encourage them. Just remember, you're not losing weight. You're getting rid of it, and you have no intentions of picking it up again. Dr. Olivia Newby, <laughs> who is a certified diabetes expert. Thank you so much. Keith, you got the last word. Oh, well, just, just stay healthy. Just get out there, walk more, and just, you know, be healthy. That's all I can say. And I want you guys to know my hubby wrote in and wants to know if I've been touched to change. So I'm going to have to get on my case with this, too, and we'll be right back. I'm with Marcellus and you all are checking out another view on WHRV 89.5. Don't go anywhere. Check us out. Went and Marsalis, who was in town a couple of weeks ago, was part of the Virginia Arts Festival. Almost a year ago, WHRO Public Media committed to telling the stories of veterans as they return home from service and transitions into civilian life. Here on Another View, we've brought you the stories of African-American veterans from several different wars. But the war that saw the highest proportion of blacks ever to serve was the war in Vietnam. Our Lisa Godley recently spoke with retired Master Chief Joe Piku, one of the many black servicemen in the early 1960s, fighting valiantly for an America where they didn't even have the right to vote. My craft was a supply boat. We carried frozen food, vegetables, bullets, and, and rockets, and beer, and stuff like that. We came from Saigon. We crossed the South China Sea. We went into the Mekong Delta. There was an area over there that we called the bottleneck. We would come in so close to the land, you can actually pull the leaves off the trees. That's how close we were. And then when we turned out to go back to sea, so to speak, while well, to the middle of the, of the river, we were vulnerable then. You can see the ladies out washing clothes by the river, kids out there in the waters and everything, and we were getting fired at from behind them. And we couldn't shoot back because uh, the craft master said, hold your fire, hold your fire, whatever, you know, whatever. Well, we could do was duck and hope we didn't get hit by a rocket or something. So we just get out of there, you know. As fast as we could. Joe Piku was in his late 20s when he joined the Navy. The New Orleans native had two reasons for doing so, to help his mother out financially and to see the world. He enlisted in 1962, three years before the law ensuring African Americans their right to vote was signed into law. And every family across this great entire searching land will live stronger in liberty will live more splendid in expectation and will be prouder to be American because of the act that you have passed that I will sign today. As far as what was going on back home, yeah, we heard a lot about it, you know, but um, there wasn't really a lot that we could do about it. We saw a lot of the uh, crazy stuff going on out, always called on the ships, you know, between uh, blacks and whites, you know what I mean? And we had, we had, uh, a lot of skirmishes. I mean, you had basically, if, 
a few uh, privileges, but not a whole bunch, you know. And it was always like, yeah, somebody was always watching you. Piku says during that time, even assignments seemed to be doled out based on race. For instance, you know, if you had a duty type thing, like as a show patrol or something like that, you know, where you're going to be going out and staying out all night and taking care of the troops that were on liberty, they would take you and put you someplace where it wasn't really that, that good of a place for you to be. So when I figured, well, I, myself, I always felt that way. Hey, I got this beat over here because I'm who I am. Not always, but um, I sometimes felt that way. Piku says he swore that once he got his first stripe, he would treat people the same way. But he didn't. Instead, using it as an opportunity to look out for young African-American sailors he saw being mistreated. He says the return home was not a pleasant one, whether you were black or white. He says if you were wearing a uniform, once again, you were a target. We landed at the airport in uh, San Francisco. And I was already proud and everything with my green uniform, you know, my fatigues and my little beret, which we wore because I was uh, what we call one of the river rats down in the, in the Delta. And the first thing I ran into was three long-haired Caucasian guys calling me a baby killer. You know, and I'm going, what's going on with this? Because we didn't get all of that over there. Even though we knew that a lot of people didn't like the war, that was just about, that was about it. It was so bad that I had some uh, civilian clothes that I wore prior to leaving Saigon. They were all wrinkled up, and uh, I tell you what, I felt so ashamed. I had to go in the restroom, and then I put the old wrinkled clothes back on so I can kind of blend in so people don't point fingers at me and start yelling at me, you know, call me names and whatever. But would he do it again? I was ashamed of what was happening here. But then I thought about, you know, well, if they want me to go over there again, I'd go back. Uh, Because it's something I had to do because I was in the military. For another view, I'm Lisa Gottlieb. And next Tuesday at 9 p.m., WHRO-TV takes a look at the later years of the Vietnam War when we bring you the documentary Last Days in Vietnam. Nominated for an Academy Award, the film tells the story of individuals desperate to rescue as many South Vietnamese as possible during the fall of Saigon. Don't miss Days in Vietnam, Last Days in Vietnam next Tuesday at 9 on WHRO-TV 15. And I hope that Again, that you will join me tonight at 5.30 um, out in Virginia Beach at the Virginia Beach Higher Education Center for Freedom Riders. Another newbie doctor, Dr. Cassandra Newbie Alexander, will be one of our guests uh, on the panel. Well, we'll be looking at clips from Freedom Riders and uh, watching that and also having a discussion. Come on out. It's free. And that's our show for today. Our guests shared a lot of information that will help you with your health challenges. So why not pass on the info by downloading our podcast and sharing it with family and friends. You can find podcasts of all of our Another View programs by visiting our website, anotherviewradio.org. Next week, we'll talk about the Harlem Renaissance and how African-American writers today have a tough time garnering an African-American audience. Authors Tim Siebels, Rebecca Mingham, Ramika Bingham and Shonda Buchanan keep it real so tune in our theme music was composed and performed by Jay Sennett Lisa Godley is our show producer Victor Bowen is our audio engineer and Chantel Davis answered our phones I'm Barbara Ham Lee have a wonderful weekend everyone let's get together again next Friday at noon for another view